so we started this adventure actually last fall. Remember the stage turned into an island, to a giant lagoon, and we were talking about the difference between living on the island and taking the voyage. And we finally decided that, that through all of this, that when we looked across what the early church was, that this really wasn't about an island, that the Christian faith was supposed to be a journey. So then we needed to define the journey. And so when we got to the beginning of this year, remember we started out in Philippians chapter 2 with that scripture that tells us to work out our faith. By the way, I'd like to invite you, if you have your copy of God's Word, you can go ahead and start turning toward Philippians chapter 3 because that's where we're going to be today. If you don't have one with you, there's one in the pew rack right there in front of you. But we started with this scripture where we're supposed to be working out our faith. And the thing about that scripture that I find interesting is because when Paul talks about that particular scripture, the Philippians are already obeying the rules. As a matter of fact, he gives them credit for not just obeying them when he's there, but also when he's not. And so if they're already obeying all the rules, what's left to work out? Don't we have it? That is, unless um, this whole Christian faith, this whole Christian journey is something more than just some set of rules and regulations. And so that's where we picked up with the crudes, and we wanted to figure out about their journey as their, as their faith evolved from just being rule followers to journey takers, how it changed. So I have a question that I want you to consider. Is she right? Now, now you have to say, was I really paying attention to the clip? We have this game at home. It's called Disney Seen It. And they show this great big long clip. And then at the end of the clip, they ask you this really obscure question that you have to go back and say how well you were listening to the clip. Well, that's what I want you to do right now. Is she right? Now, ponder it for a second. See, Eat makes this profound statement. They've journeyed across all of this way, and the land behind them is blowing up. And Grug sees the cave. Did you notice as he was trying to force his family back in it, they were all starting to resist him? And then he makes the statement. What we were doing before wasn't living. It was just not dying. Is she right? Is there a difference between living and just not dying? Take this out of your physical life and take it into your spiritual life. Is there a difference between living a Christian life and just not dying? Mm. Now, this is one of those sermons that's a great big old piece of juicy steak because you're going to have to take this home and you're going to have to chew on it for a couple of days. Because as we continue our journey through this crude theology, remember we started out and we started at the beginning with, with the rules getting destroyed and they're not going to just follow the rules anymore and they've had to take all of these new experiences. They've come a long way. As a matter of fact, we missed a sermon last week and I made the executive decision just to throw that one on the cutting room floor. If you want the notes from it, I have them in a book somewhere and I'll be happy to print them out for you, but they've had all of these experiences, and they've got all of this, this new information, and now, did you notice at the beginning of that clip, what did they say? We're here! Man, where we were trying to get to, they are there, they are at the mountain, but did you also notice that all the danger, the birds and everything, that was there too, so that didn't change. And so now here they are, and they are debating this fact of, do we head back to the cave in our brand new environment or is there something more to this? Because if Eep is right, and there's more to life than just surviving, then you know what? It changes my entire philosophy to the way I live the Christian life. So this morning, I want to discuss a living attitude. And yes, I know I had you turn to Philippians 3, and I'm in Philippians 1. I'll catch up with you in just a minute, okay? Philippians chapter 1, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. It is such a simple statement. As a matter of fact, if you counted it up, it's 12 words. But it is such a profound concept that I think we miss. Paul's statement, if I live, I live for Christ. 
So as long as my body draws breath, as long as my heart beats, then it is going to beat for Christ. That's a win. If I die, then notice he doesn't say I go to heaven. I go to be with Christ. See the difference in the theory here? I go to be with Christ, and so I am, my body no longer lives, but what I'm living for didn't change at all. I'm still living for Christ. That's a win. You see, as we begin to live our faith, I think we miss this. We live our Christian life so that someday we can go to heaven. Isn't that the promise? Isn't that what we're after? And Paul all of a sudden is throwing a wrench into this because he's got a completely different idea. Because it is more than just that. You see, in this simple 12-word statement, living for Christ in Paul's mind is as beneficial as dying and going to heaven. Wrap your brain around that, because let's face it, most of us spend our Christian life simply trying to endure this planet in hopes that at some point we get to heaven and then we can sit down and take it easy. Isn't that what we try to sell a lot? Come on, I was sold that when I was 12 years old. Come put your faith in Christ so that you can live forever. Come put your faith in Christ. There are pearly gates and seas of crystal and clouds where you get to sit there with the wings and harp and you get to play all day long and everything is going to be good. And, and that's how we try to sell our Christian life. But Paul's selling something different here. Paul's got a completely different attitude that we need to chew on. See, in our evolving faith, something that goes beyond just the crude theology of I'm going to live a life so that I can go to heaven, how does somebody develop the attitude where Christ is beneficial here and now, not just for future? Ah, that could be very useful on this planet, could it not? If I could take my faith and somehow adapt it on how to live today, Man, that would be so much better than just I'm putting it into an investment account somewhere down the road. I'm going to cash in all the chips and I'm going to go and live this happy life. And so I want to know how do I develop that kind of an attitude because it's that kind of attitude that will change the church and will change the world. And now we can all be happy because we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 8. But whatever were gains to me, this is Paul writing still, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of surpassing worth of, of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, the rules. But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Paul's first step in understanding this for me to live as Christ is he had to devalue his former life. Now, keep in mind, Paul came to Christ later in life. He was already a grown adult, an established theologian. He had all of this figured out. He would call himself a Jew among Jews. He was part of the Sanhedrin. He was the rising star. He was the person that at some point was going to be somebody in life. And so to hear these verses is very important. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, if we back up, this is what Paul says about his resume. If someone else thinks that they have reason to be putting confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, right by the rule, of the people of Israel, right by the rule, of the tribe of Benjamin, right by the rule, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, so I kept it all, right by the rule, a Pharisee, right by the rule, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. Paul says, I've had it figured out. He had his plain Stacked the gate E4 and E6. He was ready to rock and roll, but now all of a sudden, something's changed. 
because back in verses 7 through 8, the ones that are still on the screen, Paul now has some new words that he uses for that old life. That life that had it all figured out. The first word he used was the word loss. Now, I know what loss is. Loss is when you've invested something and you put all the money in it and you think you've got your retirement all figured out and then at some point in time the stock market turns or it takes a turn and then you, the investment that you were trusting in, you look at the bank account and it went from this thing to this little thing and you're like, I can't live off of that and all of the investment is loss. It's loss. It's gone. You can't bring it back. Okay, you can hope all you want that the start market is going to take another turn and it's going to bounce up and I'm going to get my money back. But let's face it, the money that you, it's just a loss. You just have to write it off. So Paul was taking all of that thing that he did before accepting Christ. And he's saying, you know what? It's a loss. It's in the loss column. I'm not counting it as credit toward what I'm doing now. It is a complete write off. Man, that's hard, isn't it? I mean, I've been living this Christian life since I was 12. Okay, and if you do the math, that's 37 years. And now you're asking me to take on a different mentality that this isn't all about just going to heaven? No, it's not. And I am asking you, step beyond yourself because not only does he count it as lost, he counts it lost. Now, I am a person that gets frustrated when things get lost. Ask my family. If I can't find something, I keep looking until the loss is found. I just can't do it. It's the OCD in me. Okay? My keys have to be in a certain spot if they're not there, and I notice they're not there. Even if I'm not going anywhere, I have to find the keys and put them in the right spot because I know if they're not there, then they must be lost. See, lost is usually something that we look for. Paul's not looking for his old life. Paul's not looking just to go to heaven. Paul's not interested in just the pearly gates. Paul's not interested in the crystal sea. Paul's not interested in the clouds and the harp and the wings. Paul's not interested in any of that. Paul's interested in something much, much deeper. And he counts the old life where I'm just trying to get to a certain destination. It's lost. And you know what? I'm not looking for it. How do I know he's not looking for it? Because of the next term he used. Garbage. Now, I know what garbage is. It's the thing when I use what I want out of it, I throw the rest away. And garbage is so unvaluable to me that I actually pay somebody else to take it away. It has negative value to my life if I continue to take it on. Have you ever met one of those people that can't throw anything away? And you walk into their house, and they have like magazines from 1932. I mean, it's just all piled everywhere. I mean, it's just there. They just can't let go of anything. And, you know, that's not how we're supposed to live our life. Paul looked at his old life. And remember, this was not a bad life. This was not an evil life. This was a life living by the rules. This was a life where he considered himself a Hebrew among Hebrews. I guess in our modern-day terms, we could say a Christian among Christians. We keep all of the I's dotted and all the T's crossed to make sure that everything is exactly like it's supposed to be. Paul takes that life, and he calls it loss, lost, and garbage. What is he talking about? I think Paul missed it, or maybe Paul got it. Paul understood that this faith isn't about the cave. There is a difference between living and just not dying. And so we have to learn how we're going to devalue the way that we used to live our life. And the good news is it isn't just a matter of stop doing. We have to obtain a new value system. We have to put our focus on something else. See, it isn't just enough to stop doing something. You have to start some new actions in your life if you are truly going to start understanding what it means for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. In Philippians chapter nine, verse chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, we read this, And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith, I want to know Christ, yes, 
to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, become like him in his death, since some somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. So this is a quite important value system that Paul's throwing out to us, and I want to make sure we put up our antennas and we catch this. Because in Paul's new value system, he values faithful following over righteous living. Faithful following over righteous living. Now be careful because the two can look very similar. I can be trying to live by the rules and think I'm being a faithful follower. However, what Paul was talking about is something that's more than the rules. He's talking about a faithful follower because here's the deal. If you're just living by the rules... When push comes to shove, and it's all put out there before you, and you have to make choices in your life, then you know what? We can bend the rules, can't we? As a matter of fact, shh, don't tell anybody, I've been known to break a few rules as we've gone along this path. When something didn't line up with something that I wanted to do in my life, then you know what? I can bend them, I can break them, I can even ask forgiveness for bending and breaking them because that's living by the rules. But if I'm a faithful follower, then I have to keep my eyes on where the leader is going and I can't afford to break the rules, so to speak, because if you're going to follow, you have to have somebody to follow, right? And so if I decide all of a sudden I'm going to go off on my own way, then eventually I have to go back and find the leader. See, there is a big difference. And so Paul is saying, I don't want to just have a righteous life. Don't tell me that I have a life that looks good. Tell me I have a life that looks like Christ. You see, he wanted to know Christ. That's a very big statement. Again, he wasn't looking for gates, crystal seas, mansions in the sky. He was simply looking for one thing. He wanted to know all about Christ. He didn't want to study him. As a matter of fact, he wanted to experience Christ. That word know that he's using in that verse there, where he wants to know Christ, if you translate it back, now remember the Old Testament's written in Aramaic and Hebrew, and the New Testament's written in Greek, but the words kind of coincide. And if you take this word, no, is not, the, is not to gain knowledge about. That word, no, translates back to the Hebrew word that when Adam and Eve were in the garden and they were there, and it says Adam knew his wife, that's the no. Paul's not looking for informational knowledge. Paul is looking for an intimate relationship with Christ. That is huge. He doesn't want to be smarter about who Christ is. He wants to be more intimate with who Christ wants him to be. That's a big difference, and that is the difference between just living and not dying. See, he wants to know Christ. See, this living, he wanted to live like Christ. That's what he wanted to do. Now, this doesn't make sense to me because how did Christ live? Well, remember, he didn't have a house. He didn't have good family relationships. We, we know about that. Christ didn't really have a retirement plan, did he? Well, I guess he sort of did. Um, when he says, I want to live like Christ, then you, he knows the end of the story, doesn't he? Paul knows what happened to Jesus. He wanted to live just like Christ did, even to the point of experiencing death and resurrection. And I just don't know very many people that, are, that I would count sane that are wishing for this. But Paul's got a different perspective. You see, in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, the verses that are wrapped around for me to live as Christ, but to die as gain. This is how living for Christ looks. Now, I want you to know. Antennas up. Pay attention, Philippian church. I want you to know this. Brothers and sisters, so men and women, this is not a message for just one. It's for everybody. That was what happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. 
As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So this is the life that Paul had chosen for me to live as Christ. And you know what? Paul's value system had some definite impacts on his life. You know what it didn't do? It did not make him happy. That is, unless you count happy living in a dark, dank prison cell with chains on you, or under house arrest, is actually where he is at this point, with chains on you, where you're not even allowed to go to the bathroom by yourself because there's a guard with you no matter what you do. If, if that's happy... Paul got that, but I don't think that's what we would count happy. You see, for me to live as Christ isn't going to always be happy. It did make him rich. I mean, I'm reading that verse that he's talking about, and it, it, it didn't provide to his bottom line at all. I mean, unless you count rich something other than money, because it says he's here kind of all by himself at this point. It didn't make him healthy. I don't know anybody that, that goes through life like Paul has lived and when you get to the end of his life and he's talking about how he's cold and how he's alone and how he's been abandoned and, and he's not healthy. Okay. Certainly didn't make him popular. I mean, they tried to stone him. They kicked him out of town. He ended up shipwrecked. He ended up just kind of wandering all over the place and so... Paul was not Mr. Popularity. Trust me, when they said Paul was coming to your town, they didn't put up the revival tent and say, woohoo, let's sell tickets. They were like, oh no. Now we've got problems because he causes trouble everywhere he goes. So that's his value system. But Paul's value system worked in this way. The closer he got to Christ, the louder he spoke. You want to know if you're living to live the Christian life and not just try, not trying to die? Here's the deal. The closer you get to Christ, the more you talk about Christ. It works the same way in every relationship. Go and talk to somebody who's just started dating somebody or a newlywed or a new parent. Everything they talk about is, guess what, about the new relationship. And the more they stay in the relationship, the more stories they get. The reason I have so many stories about my family is because we've been together for a while and we know each other and we have this knowledge of each other because the more you get around Christ, the more you live this life that way, the more you talk about it. So here's the first test. Are you talking about him? Or are you talking about heaven? Oh, wait. There's a difference? Oh, there's a difference. See, it's the difference between living your life to live and not living your life just to die. Are you talking about Jesus or are you talking about heaven? Are you talking about when things are at the end, or are you talking about who is, who is part of your life now? There is a big difference. The more he talked and the more closer he got, the more he spoke, and there was a side effect to that. The louder he spoke, the more they tried to silence him. See, his path was sending him down a place that nobody wouldn't think about. The louder he spoke and the more he talked about Christ, the more people went, shh. Don't do that. You're not doing nothing but causing me problems and troubles. It would be much easier if you didn't talk about this in the fall. You could be free. You could walk down the streets. You could have friends. You could go to the restaurants. You could do all the things. You could be a Roman citizen. And Paul's like, it's not worth it to me. Because my value system is for me to live as Christ, but to die is gain. The more they tried to silence him, closer he got to Christ. The more people that pounded on his life and told him, this is not the way you do it, Paul. This is not how it's supposed to work. You're supposed to just be good, keep the rules, do the things you're supposed to do, obey the paintings on the cave wall, follow the same schedule, do it this way, Paul. The more they tried to silence him, the more he spoke. Do you see the endless loop that gets set up here when you live your life this way? I'm a software engineer. I understand the frustration behind an endless loop. You get a program into an endless loop and it just sits there and it runs, 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 and the only way you can stop it is to wait for the memory to fill up and crash or cut the computer off. That's it. 
So Paul had put himself into this endless loop where I am going to talk about Christ, and I understand you're going to try to silence me, and the more you silence me, the more I'm going to talk about Christ, thus the more you're going to silence me, and there's only two ways to shut me up. Okay? Cut out my tongue. And then I'm just going to learn another way to talk about it. Or you're going to have to kill me. Man, that's an attitude for me to live as Christ. But the guy is game. If you don't silence me, I'm going to talk about Jesus. If you silence me, oh well, I'm going to go live with Jesus and there's going to be somebody to take my place. That's the way the church was presented. You see, this idea that Paul had, it was inspiring others. Man, how frustrating must that have been. The other people were starting to look at Paul sitting there in chains and saying, you know what, I want to do that. I want to go and live for Christ to the point that they put me in chains. And the palace guard, could you imagine what it was like trying to be a palace guard around Paul? You're the only person he's got to talk to, and he's only got one thing to talk about. So guess what he's going to talk to about night and day? Jesus. They probably drew straws and short straw had to watch Paul. Because that's the way it was going to work. It was so frustrating when Paul had this attitude for me to live as Christ. But to die is gain. And so Paul gives us the church today. Well, he gave it to Philippians, but we're going to steal it and bring it forward a few thousand years. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. Join together in following my examples, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many lives, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is their shame, their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like glorious bodies. Paul's advice to us, first thing is follow the example. That example that Paul ran out, what does he say? He says, don't live by the rules, live by the example of all the people before you. And all of those people, well, you need to live in Christ. Remember where all the apostles are at this point in the ministry. With the exception of John, who's probably on the island of the Patmos at this point. They're either dead and chained or scheduled for execution. Follow the leaders. Okay. And he says, you know what? Listen to what you've been told. Now, he wants you to understand that you're supposed to listen to what you've been told. Not the years and years and years. Listen to this one simple idea. He's talking about, listen to what I've told you. For me to live as Christ, but to die as gain. Notice he didn't say for you to live as Christ. Because he can't make that decision for you. He can only make that decision for himself. But he's telling you to listen to the decision. And decide for yourself. Don't focus on the here and now. I'm going to tell you something. I got very focused on the here and now as that plane was circling that airport. You know, it was going all around, and they were going. I'm like, okay, we're running a little late here, folks. Okay, I've got a plan. I've got a plan to catch. And it's amazing. I had been reading this book, and I had been very into the book, and the second I took a look at my clock, all of the stuff that I was learning from the book kind of got put on hold, and I was more concerned about where were they going to leave me. How was I going to get home my focus completely changed, and Paul's like, you know, don't worry about that stuff. Just keep your focus. For me to live as Christ, but to die as gain. Seek a Savior, not heaven. Oh, that's huge. As a matter of fact, if you're keeping your notes, go ahead and put a big star and a highlight and everything else. If we're living for Christ, I'm not looking to go to heaven. I'm looking to seek my Savior. That is huge. Because if I'm simply looking for heaven, then I'm just going to live by the rules so that I'm good enough to get there. So I can be the person that speaks to the door at the very last minute before the plane takes off. 
but I'm seeking a Savior. Folks, that's a lifelong journey. 